Hello. If you're able to, please close your eyes. Take a deep breath in. And a deep breath out. Relax your shoulders. Unclench your jaw. Take another deep breath in. And another breath out. You can open your eyes now. My name is David, and welcome to Mindful Moments. Today, I have to say thank you. I feel like I start by saying thank you a lot, but I'm just so grateful. Every week, people are listening, and that is an added bonus to me enjoying the process of creating these episodes. Last week's episode was the 75 Hard episode, and as you'll know if you listen to that episode, I didn't tell anyone whilst in the 75 Hard I was so, so desperate to talk about it. I haven't stopped talking about it this week. But to be able to talk about it for a full half an hour in last week's episode and have so many people listen and respond to it means so much. It really means a lot to me. So thank you very, very much. I posted clips throughout last week of things from last week's episode. And the response they got was interesting. Obviously, I gave a lot of disclaimers in last week's episode because, as I said, I didn't want anyone to feel bad because I'd done the 75 hard challenge. I didn't want anyone to feel like they had to then go out and do things like that. But I did want it to have an overall positive impact, as is the case with everything I create. A lot of people took those videos in very different ways. A lot of people did receive them very well. There were a few people who didn't seem to enjoy some of the things I was saying. And most of that was absolutely fine. It's part of the job. I can handle it. But one thing that didn't sit well with me is how much umbrage people seem to take with the 10 pages of a non-fiction book part of the challenge. Again, if you listened to the full episode and you knew the context, that didn't seem like too bad a thing. But of course, it's hard to give a lot of context in short form content. So a lot of people weren't happy with that part of the challenge because they were asking me, why did you read the fiction? 10 pages doesn't seem like very much. And I find all that quite funny. But at the same time, It did get to me because don't challenge me on reading fiction. Reading fiction is one of the great loves of my life. Always has been and always will be. And so, you know, it it, it touches a particular nerve when someone accuses me of not valuing fiction. Because to me, that is one of the most important things that exists in the world. It's so much of the source material for the things that we watch, for the other things that we consume. And just reading fiction in general, to me, is one of the best things that exists. It's something that I want everyone to be able to do, everyone to feel like they have access to. And last week, I said how passionate I was about reading and how much I wanted to do a reading episode in future. And so it seemed that all signs pointed to me doing a reading episode today. So that's what we're talking about. All things books, all things reading, how I got into reading, why I love reading, how I lost and regained my love for reading, and things that I find to be best practices when it comes to reading. Again, purely anecdotal, as everything is that I say on this podcast, but hopefully me sharing my experiences will help other people. And if I can help just one person feel like they have access or they're able to read, that is a job well done for me because it's a joy that I think we should all share. It's a joy I think that I want everyone to have access to. So reading. I think my love for reading definitely comes from both of my parents. Both my parents are very avid readers and value very much the the benefits of reading. When I was younger, I have three brothers and a sister. My sister is the youngest. I came along at the, uh, quite a few years. There's, there's a big age gap between myself and my sister. So for a while, it was just myself and my three brothers. And when we were younger, we used to have a lot of very specific rules we had in place to stop arguments and fights. For example, one of the rules we had in place is that, you know, if you were fighting someone or you're ignoring someone or you're playing a game with someone, any anything you can continue and continue and continue until someone says, I don't like it. If someone says, I don't like it, you have to stop. It was like a magic phrase. You just had to stop. I don't like it. Things have to stop. 
Another of those rules was if someone was reading, you had to leave them alone. That's how important it was. If someone is reading, they are doing something that's good for them and that they enjoy, you had to leave them alone. And so a lot of the time, I would read for some peace and quiet, which is ironic because I was also the one causing the most noise and distraction. So once I was t- finished with my own noise and distraction, I'd say, okay, guys, leave me alone. I'm reading. As I said last week, one of my favorite things to do in the world back then, when I was small, was to get a book, sit with my back on a radiator and read. In the winter, when the radiator was warm, it was comforting. In the summer, when the radiator was cool, it was refreshing. And I would just escape. I'd read and I would just escape. I used to love it. When I was in primary school, in the British school system, we had a series of books called The Magic Key. I'll say that and a lot of people who grew up in England will know exactly what books I'm talking about. The protagonists were called Biff, Chip and Kipper. And they all had this magic key that would glow and take them to different places and through different adventures. And these books got more advanced as you went through the school stages. And you were supposed to ideally read a a certain amount of those books every year as you went through school. And I think I finished the entire series of of those books a couple of years before I finished primary school because I just loved it. Reading was the one thing that never felt like homework and never felt like a chore. It was just pure joy. I just loved it so much. Growing up reading that much, obviously was very good at English. And it was something that came very naturally to me. So English was always my favorite subject throughout school as well. I got to sixth form, did English at university, and read a lot throughout that time. Well, read a lot throughout the time up until sixth form, which is the ages of 16 to 18, where you study A-levels. When I was studying my A-levels, this is the first time I didn't have any time to read. I would watch some TV, but reading really took a backseat in terms of entertainment. And reading also started to feel like something I should be doing to better myself rather than something I enjoyed, which inevitably made it feel a little bit more like a chore. And as soon as it started to feel like a chore, that kick-started maybe five or six years in the wilderness, as it were, not reading and seeing reading as something that I should be doing, something that was hanging over my head, something I know I should be doing more of, but I'm not doing. And so because I felt guilt towards it and around it, I avoided it for even longer. So I spent a good period of time not finding any joy at all in reading, which is a sad thing for something that I used to love so much when I was a child. I know that happens to a lot of us in a lot of areas, things that you enjoyed as a child when there was no expectation attached to it. Suddenly you become an adult, and it feels like a burden when at once, at one time, it was something that you just loved. When I finished university, I finished in 2020, which, as we all know, was not a stellar year for anybody. And I started thinking more about life in general and whether I'm enjoying my time and the things I'm applying myself to, etc. And the fact that I didn't read like I used to really wasn't sitting well with me. But again, For the next year and a half, it was very much, I need to start reading again. And it felt like there was a pressure to it. It felt like I need to start reading again. And it felt like it was going to be a chore when I started again. So that's what put me off getting back into reading for such a long time. And then 2021, one of my New Year's resolutions, I don't make too many resolutions. I try and make aspirations and see what happens. But I resolved myself to say, I'm not, I didn't say I'm going to read more. I said, I'm going to do what it takes to rediscover my love for reading, whatever that looks like. And so I set myself a challenge. I read quite quickly, but to me, the, to me, the quantity of what I was reading wasn't important, nor at first really was the quality. I just wanted to redevelop the habit and find the enjoyment. Those were my two main objectives in starting to read again start the habit, get the habit locked in and make sure that I was doing it for the enjoyment. So I set myself a challenge of reading one fiction book, one non-fiction book and a book that I read or would have read when I was a child. The fiction book was so that I was reading something that was of quality that I thought. Um, I also wanted to talk more to other people about reading, but without the kind of 
sometimes it feels like there's a bit of competition when you're talking about reading with other people. It's, oh, I've read this. Oh, I've read this already. Oh, I've read this quicker, quick, quicker than you read it. I read this however many years ago and it was, I find it okay. And you didn't, you find it good, which means that I have better taste than you. I'd feel that a lot in some of the conversations I was having. So I wanted to have very good, very organic conversations with my friends who are readers simply about what we, what we enjoyed, what we loved. And I love getting recommendations from people. So I wanted to read one fiction book, one nonfiction book, because I did want to improve myself. I want to say nonfiction. I prefer nonfiction books that are more educational than kind of self-help or self-improvement. Not, not that there's anything wrong at all with that genre. I just think it's very easy to read those things and suddenly start feeling inadequate. And that was not my goal at all. I didn't want anything else. <laughs> I pushed myself quite hard generally in my own head. I didn't want anything else to add on top of that pressure and to make me feel worse about myself. Reading was something that was supposed to add joy to my life. So I didn't want to do anything that was going to make me feel worse, essentially. And then a book that I read or would have read as a child, that is the one that I'm very proud of for coming up with. And the one that I think worked the most, because of course, the thing I was trying to recapture was that childlike joy, was just the pure enjoyment without agenda of reading and escaping into an adventure. So those are the three things that I decided to do. And from the beginning of last year, for whatever reason, it really did stick. I made sure that I was making time every day to read. I have a Kindle because I read a lot of books and I unfortunately just don't have the space for paperback books. I love paperback books. It's, they're, they're my favorite, but I just don't have the space for all the books that I want to read. On top of that, I have been told many times that there are many resources where you can download books for free and all that kind of stuff. But especially as a creator myself, I really want authors to be paid for their work. I think it's not ludicrous to say that someone who's spent years of their life creating something should be paid for that every time that someone consumes it. So there's that, there's no question to me that I will be paying for my books. It's just, yeah, this, this for, for the sake of space, having an e-reader works, works best for me. So I got a Kindle and every night before bed, I'll put my phone down at least half an hour before I go to sleep and read for 20 to 30 minutes. I'm told that that's actually very good for your blood pressure. I need to do more research on that personally. But what I can say for sure is that it is a much better way for me to go to sleep than it is to be on my phone until the last second. It really takes me out of my own life for a moment. Lets my imagination wander, but also in a way that works it and makes it tired. By the time I've read however many, a chapter or two, my brain is really ready to drift off. And it's just a very nice way to end my day every day. And it gives me something to look forward to at bedtime. I do feel a lot like a child. Do you, did you ever, when you were younger, you'd be reading and you'd have your flashlight or torch, you'd be under the covers, you hear footsteps, you quickly try and surreptitiously hide the flashlight under your pillow, do the most unrealistic snores of all time. I used to do that a lot. And it makes me feel like that. There's no one coming to confiscate my book anymore, but it makes me feel like that. And that was what I was talking about, the, 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 the glee, the joy of, of reading, of reading being something that I really enjoy more than anything. So started reading minimum three books a month. And because that was my baseline and because that wasn't very many for how often I read at university, I used to read one or two books a week. Because I set myself quite a low target, I was always hitting that target at least. And that made it feel very manageable to be able to read more than that. Because I set myself something that was actually quite low for me, it just meant that I would always stick to it. Which I think when you're starting out on something new, I think that's a much better way to go about it. Rather than start too intense, burn out, and then feel like it's something that's insurmountable, I think it's much better to start low. And even if it seems too low, it's just the showing up and the consistency that matters at first. And then you can always increase your targets. Whereas when you've been demoralized, it's quite hard to then scale back. It feels like a step backwards. So that's what I've been doing. And it's been absolutely wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. In the last year and a half, I've read some really amazing books. In fact, my Kindle app gave me a notification just yesterday saying that I've been reading for 100 days. I have a streak of 100 days reading in a row. And I've read for 52 weeks in a row which is amazing. I don't read every single book I read on Kindle. Sometimes I read paperbacks. So that's probably why it isn't longer. But even that, I felt very proud of myself to know that for 52 weeks in a row, 
a year in a row, I have been reading every single week. Makes me very happy. Makes me very happy because it's something that really does add to my life. But even more than that, it's something that makes me happy. And I've prioritized my happiness in that area. It just so happens that it also adds to me in other ways in terms of self-development. So it's really lovely. I'm really happy. In terms of my advice for reading, I think first and foremost, reading is entertainment. And so I needed to stop looking at it like it was, like it was educational. Because yes, it is educational, but that's more a byproduct of the nature of reading. When you read, there are no images. So you have to put your imagination to work. You have to put your mind to work and you really have to think hard. That's why it's difficult to concentrate on. So because it adds to you in that way and because it, everyone knows that it's kind of a good thing to do to read, I think there's this expectation that reading is this thing that is always educational and that makes it seem like it's not fun. But really, when reading for recreation and reading in our free time, it's entertainment, the same as anything else is entertainment. If I was watching a TV show and the TV show was really poorly written, moving very slowly, the plot didn't give me much, I'd stop watching it. It's the same with books. It's exactly the same with books. Now, I'm someone who sees things through, generally. If you've been listening for the past few weeks and if you've followed me and followed my content for longer, you'll know that. But for me, if a book isn't adding anything or it's not entertaining, I'm not reading it. I'm not finishing it. No disparagement at all to the author. I'm just not the target audience, so I won't be reading anymore. Approaching books like that was crucial to me enjoying reading again because there was nothing about it to me that I did that felt like a chore. The second I started to make it into a chore was the second I'd start to avoid it again. I needed to make sure that I was reading for pleasure. That is it. So never feel guilty about stopping a book because it's not entertaining to you. That's okay. Reading is entertainment, same as anything else. It's also very, very good for my attention span. Everything I consume on my phone at the moment is short form. I even find it hard to watch full YouTube videos. <laughs> so because of that, I knew that reading was something that would help me be able to concentrate. Because again, unless you focus on a book properly, you can't imagine the things that are going on. You can't visualize properly. You really do have to focus. And when I talked about the 10 pages of nonfiction that the 75 Hard includes last week, a lot of people said 10 pages, everything else seems so extreme, 10 pages is nothing. But especially if you're not reading at all, reading 10 pages and actually absorbing those 10 pages, not the kind of reading where, <laughs> you know, the kind of reading I'm talking about where you look at the page and you've, you've seen the words over and over, but you haven't absorbed a single thing. Not that kind of reading. Reading and actually taking on the information is very difficult, especially if you haven't been in the habit of reading. So reading 10 pages a day or reading a small amount a day, again, as I said earlier, saying a small target like that and actually sticking to it is far, far better than saying, I'm going to finish this book by X time. You don't get there and then you just feel guilt around it and then don't go back to it. That's really not the aim at all when it comes to starting to read again. Another thing I would really advise is talking to other people, researching a lot for the kind of stories that you like, because reading is a way of absorbing a story. Same as a film, same as a TV show, it's a, a way of absorbing a story. And you want a good story. You want a story that's going to give you everything you want. And there are ugh, many, many, many stories available, many stories out there, true, fictional. It's just one of the things I'm in awe of when it comes to authors is that they build entire universes sometimes that just don't exist. They can mimic the richness of life, the depth of emotion in a few words on a page. It's just unbelievable. Every time I read a book, I'm really in awe of it. And so finding the right stories is very essential. And there's nothing wrong with reading a hundred of the same stories. What are those there's a, there's a series of romance novels. The name escapes me now. I think it's Mills and Boone. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I think it's Mills and Boone novels, which are, I think they're romance. And it's pretty much the same story or the same format every time. But if that's what people love, that's what people love. And there's actually something so satisfying about sitting down to read a book 
and knowing exactly what you're going to get from it and knowing by the end, I'm going to be happy about this. It's wonderful. And we rewatch movies and TV shows and things that make us happy all the time. So it's the same for books. I've reread many, many of my favorite books, many of my favorite books. One of my favorite nonfiction books is called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And with nonfiction books, it's actually probably better to reread those because they're quite um, informational in nature. Quite often, I won't absorb everything the first time, so I will need to go back to reread them. But again, sometimes I'll reread books to recapture the feeling. So there's a book called Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, a Nigerian author. And it was one of the first books written by an African author to really make it over to the Western part of the world. It's a book that's very important to both my parents. And they told me about it when I was 16 or 17, around the time I was applying to university. And I included that book in my personal statement in all, all my interviews because the impact of that book on me was huge. And every time I want to return to that part of my life or I want to feel the value of my parents' impact in in my life, I'll return to things fall apart. I'll read that book again and I'll feel what I felt the first time I read it. And to be able to have that is a really wonderful thing. A really, really wonderful thing. Books can be a timestamp in our life. And so returning to that time and returning to those feelings is always something that can bring us a lot of joy too. In terms of reading, I actually want to talk a little bit more as well about reading a children's book or a book that I've read when I was when I was a child or a teenager. I spent a lot of my time when I was young in libraries. In the school library, whenever I was in school, and even when I was smaller. In fact, my mum used to take us, British libraries used to do story times. I'm sure they still do. And as I said, my mum had four boys. There was a point my parents had would have had a baby, a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and a six-year-old. My brothers and I are all about two years apart in age, which is incredible to me. It's incredible that they made it. And my mum would take us to story times at libraries. Now, this was a master stroke from her on many levels. One, in libraries, you had to be silent. So she could get hours of peace. Two, reading was very, very good for us and learning stories was very good for us and we'd love it. And three, it made us have something to look forward to that was centered around books. It would be a trip out of the house. We'd go to all the libraries in our local borough and we'd sit and listen to stories for an hour and it'd be absolutely wonderful. I've got very, very fond memories of doing all of that. And so being in libraries from early enabled me to know how to browse and choose my own books and let me know the things I was interested in. And as I said, when I started reading again as an adult, I wanted to recapture some of that joy. And the thing with young adult fiction and even children's books is that they're written very simply so that children can understand them. But that often means the concepts that they talk about are simplified greatly for a child's understanding. And when you read that with the perspective of an adult, it can actually add a lot to your life. So there's a series of books called uh, Redwall written by an author called Brian Jacks, who passed away a few years ago. My younger brother Daniel and myself especially used to love the Redwall books. I think there are 24 of them. And I read all 24 of them again this year. And the series of books is about these anthropomorphic animals. They fight these incredible battles and go across the country. Kind of the time period is probably equivalent to our 1700s. But these animals talk and do these they, 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 some of the some of the language in these books is unbelievable i think i read the word inveterate the other day and I, I i was like wow that is a serious word inveterate i am an inveterate optimist you can google that if you don't understand the word inveterate because i had to but i'm an inveterate op- optimist that's how i describe myself now but in one of these books there's a character that that dies and the way that grief is discussed and dealt with, just really blew me away at this bit. In fact, I would like to share a passage from one of the Red Wall books. So this book is called The Tagarung. And as I said, children's book. But the way that big concepts are simplified in children's books sometimes add so much, add so much when you read it with an adult's perspective. So as I said, in this this passage, there's a character that's passed away and there's another character or another two characters who are crying and mourning and trying to wipe away their tears 
and trying to stop crying essentially because they feel like they shouldn't be. And this is what one of the characters and what that original character says to them. I've grieved and shed tears long and loud for my departed loved ones. Don't be ashamed to weep. It is only right to grieve. Tears are only water and flowers and trees and fruit cannot grow without water. But there must be sunlight also. A wounded heart will heal in time. And when it does, the memory and love of our lost ones is sealed inside to comfort us. That's in a kid's book. That's in a child's book. I lost a friend earlier this year. My girlfriend and I lost a friend earlier this year. And I am very good at speaking about how I feel. But I'm not very good at processing emotions, especially in a physical way, especially crying. I'm not very good at it. And I read this passage. I felt the tears just unlock and release and flow. And so, again, reading in any form adds to your life. It really does. And you don't have to be reading classics. You don't have to be reading critically acclaimed works all the time. Anything that entertains you, brings you joy, adds to your life in any way, is a valuable read. It's worth reading. It's worth doing. So, yes, I have a deep, deep love for reading. I enjoy it very much. Now, I do it every day. And it does make me feel like the best version of myself. Not because, not just because I'm educating myself or because I feel like I'm a better person because I'm reading, but just because I'm prioritizing my happiness in that way. And to do that in any form makes anyone feel good. I hope I've encouraged you to read a few pages, if nothing else. Thank you for being here. And whatever you're doing this week, I hope you have a wonderful one.